part of the world you're listening from. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Board of Advocates for Dignity, I would like to welcome you to the inaugural Advocates for Dignity webinar. Due to COVID-19, as Advocates for Dignity, we are bringing this program to you via the web rather than in person, which may seem to be a most unfortunate uh, uh, incident at first. But when you think about it, because of COVID-19, we have reached an international audience, which we would not have been able to do had we done this program face-to-face -face in Sydney. Webinars look like a way of the future and are here to stay. It is our one. We'll continue to do many more after this. For those of you who don't know the Ad for Dignity, we're an advocacy organization that uh, seeks to promote the rule of law, democracy, and to preserve fundamental human rights and liberties with a special focus on Turkey and its citizens abroad. The Advocates for Dignity is a non-profit organization established by Australians of Turkish descent uh, who seek to raise awareness about the injustices taking place to make the wider Australian community aware of the unlawful crackdown of the citizens and the cessation of press freedom in Turkey. Today, the 15th of July, marks the fourth anniversary of the tragic coup attempt in Turkey whose masterminds are still not known to date. Yes, the Gulen inspired his met civil society movement and Mr. Gulen himself have been made the scapegoat of as the instigator, instigators of this so-called coup attempt. However, when you look at who the coup attempt benefited, benefited, you will clearly see that it has benefited the Erdogan government uh, the most. On the contrary, the Hizmet movement suffered as a consequence of the coup attempt in that it had all of its institutions, for example, the 1,000 odd private primary and secondary colleges, the university, universities, the cultural centers, the tutorial centers, the hospitals, the humanitarian aid organization called Kimse Yokmu, student dormitories, etc., etc., closing down. As a consequence, and also in, in some of the Muslim majority Erdogan aligned countries around the world where the Hizmet movement had schools um, taken over by the Turkish government. But the 29. Uh, that was held like a, an iftar dinner. Uh, so it's very simple reasons. The, uh, so the, the evening's uh, this evening's webinar titled Turkey's 15th of July coup attempt and its consequence, consequences. Uh, we will have a Q&A session with the film producer of the documentary, A Gift from God, Jürgen Lorentzen, who will be asked a series of questions by the former ABC radio host, John Cleary. Regarding the coup event and the terrifying consequences as a result to Turkey and its citizens. We'll also show, show a short film clip from the film uh, during the webinar in the middle of it. Without further ado, I will introduce our facilitator for the webinar, John Cleary. John Cleary is a veteran ABC broadcaster and one of Australia's best known commentators on religion. In his 30 year career with the ABC, he has worked extensively in both radio and television, but is known principally for his association with Sunday nights on ABC uh, local radio and, and the religion report on ABC radio. John began his career in Perth, where he was one of the original Compass team on uh, ABC TV and a co-presenter of the philosophy program Meridian on Radio National in the 1990s. And for several years, John has appeared uh, in, in a regular slot on the ABC Youth Network, Triple J. His uh, 1992 book on the Salvation Army in Australia was awarded the Christian Book of the Year. In 2008, John was the host of the interfaith event held by the Catholic Church in conjunction with World Youth Day and the visit of Pope Benedict XVI. And John uh, is also uh, on the board, advisory board of Divinity Intercultural Foundation. I will hand over to John to introduce our keynote speaker, Jürgen, and uh, thanks, John. Mehmet, thank you. Well, the coup events in Turkey referred to by Mehmet 
were brought back to us uh, this week uh, in stark contrast for many when uh, the announcement was made by President Erdogan that the great uh, Hagia Sophia, uh, long in its history, founded as a, uh, a Christian cathedral and then a mosque and in, for the last, the best part of the last uh, century, has been uh, a public museum. Uh, President Erdogan announced that that would become a, um, once again, revert to being a mosque, uh, provoking some concern across the world, particularly among Orthodox Christian communities, the Russian Orthodox and the Greek communities in particular. It brought back into focus many of the events in Turkey. And Jürgen Blodensen, uh, tonight's filmmaker, is a documentary filmmaker with a distinguished academic career at the University of Oslo, particularly in literature and gender studies. He's a past president of the Norwegian Nonfiction Writers Association. And just for diversity, in 2008, he was a member of the Norwegian government's New Children's Act Committee. He has a long-term interest in gender equity and the prevention of domestic violence. His filmmaking includes as the producer of KIO, a short shortlisted for best documentary short at the Oscars in 2017, and as co-producer of Beauty and the Dogs, premiered under Un Certain Regard at Caen in 2017. Now, I should say before handing over to, uh, to Jürgen that you too can participate in tonight's discussion by sending us questions by Zoom or by using YouTube. Just get on and tap away and we'll um, put your questions up as they come to us during the program. The film that we're about to speak of, A Gift from God, outlines the events of 2015 in Turkey with a combination of much unseen actuality from the events descriptions from those caught up in and affected by the moment, and analysis from one or two people who've had a chance to reflect on those events. Jürgen Lorenzen, welcome to this webinar. Thank you, John. It's a pleasure to be here, and I'm very, very happy to have you as my host tonight. Jürgen, I must say, the stunning opening to your documentary with that sweeping vista over the mass rally as... Uh, President Erdogan recites the words, um, a, a, a, a phrase that was eerily familiar for those who are familiar with the political history of, of Europe, almost echoing the words, ein Volk, ein Reich, ein Führer, so uh, familiar to those associated with Nazi Germany, uh, sets the tone that underlies much of your documentary here is not a normal civil society movement, despite the thousands that uh, almost uh, were, were seen in adulation of President Erdogan and his achievements. That moment takes us into a very powerful uh, reflection of the events of that night. Two questions to open. Why that opening? And secondly, you've got and I'd like you to elaborate on this, some remarkable actuality film for the events of that night, uh, some not seen before. So one, the emotional opening, and second, the, the actuality and how you came to get it. First of all, we, we have to admit that uh, he is quite good at it. You know, he has learned from history when it comes to how to arrange mass meetings. That's absolutely, you know, he has been uh, for, for many years now, been training on doing this, you know, gathering people, busing people in, giving them gifts, uh, giving out uh, flags to, to wave and, uh, and uh, caps to wear in the entrances to the places where he is having these mass meetings. And, you know, I've seen him coming into uh, to this arena to where a lot of people are gathered and it's like he's coming in like a rock star. You know, it's like walking back and forth on the stage, pointing to people, waving, you know, and it's like a very, very special mass feeling being there uh, and the way he's, uh, he's meeting his people, you know, the, the, the people that support him. But in many ways, they're also paid to be there. We have to be aware of that, you know, they have uh, over the countries, they are, they are giving out gifts and, uh, and, uh, and uh, goodie bags for people when they're uh, showing up. Uh, when it comes to the second part, the opening, it, uh, it was very clear from the beginning that we had to open with the happening on the Bosporus Bridge. 
because the bridge of a Bosporus uh, has been made to the symbol of the coup attempt. Uh, Erdogan made his uh, first year anniversary there, the second year anniversary, he was sort of celebrating the victory of the people and, and, the, and the government on the bridge. And he renamed the bridge, as we know, into the 14th of July, 15th of July uh, bridge. So uh, I, I thought immediately that we have to start here and we have to find out what happened. What happened actually? We have seen some glimpses on television. And uh, then I started really working detailed with journalists, with people sending me clips from their films. And in the end, I got uh, a long film from one guy that filmed it from like 10 o'clock in the evening, the whole night until seven o'clock in the morning. And uh, parts of that I cannot use, but it reveals even worse things that I have shown you. And uh, when, you, when you look at it from nine o'clock in the evening until seven o'clock in the morning, you see that the story here is quite different, you know? First of all, I have seen that they are, uh, some of the soldiers uh, are shooting with rubber bullets. I've seen people are falling down. They're getting up again and, and getting out uh, of the civil people that are moving out. But I cannot say that they're not shooting sharp. They can also shoot sharp. I'm not sure about that, you know? And I've also seen that the cannons are shooting, but I cannot see that people are falling because of that. So uh, the amount of deaths and how they were killed is also unclear. And I've also very clearly shown clips that Sadat, the, the, um, his uh, Erdogan's private army, we can say, they were there and they were regulating the masses and sending the masses in and out. So a lot of things here are arranged uh, and uh, there are still things that we need to tell that we haven't told about what happened on that bridge. What, what was remarkable to me is that some of the material you showed is unarguable. That is the group of soldiers who were on the bridge was a small group, maybe a small platoon group. or a couple of platoons. And they not were more than 50 people, yeah. not more than... 50, and they were not soldiers, they were cadets, yeah. you know, with a couple of officers. Then the other thing that's quite stunning is the police who arrive at the bridge don't actually act like police. They act more like casual security guards who say, oh, well, look, you know, if, <laughs> if that's what yeah. you want to do. As a yeah, crowd yeah. arrives, yeah. And that crowd seems to be prepared for yeah. what they're going to face. That's a, for anybody who's been to Istanbul, that is a very long bridge. And to get a crowd like that walking across the bridge that big um, to confront a very small group of soldiers, it almost, it, it, it has the immediate effect of something that has been put together quite clearly you can you can yeah. tell that this is not this is not a coup in any sense of the word it's a gathering of yeah. few soldiers on the bridge who yeah. then get um, the police allow them to go and attack uh, be attacked by a mob and some of them quite violent no well, it's it's terrible to to watch it it's really really terrible and devastating to watch what happened there and but, uh, the, uh, some of the groups the people are there and the police i know that uh, hundreds of police were right around the corner they didn't interfere at all. So these cadets initially think they are going to help save the country from yes. an ISIS-backed coup. Yes. What they find very soon is they are being portrayed or they are being attacked by a mob and then portrayed as the coup perpetrators. Yes. Yes. You take us into a discussion with the family of one of these soldiers yeah. who was savagely beaten to death. What was their understanding of their son's role? Uh, they are, of course, 100% sure that uh, their son are innocent. He would never, ever participate in a, in a coup against uh, the Turkish state. You know, he was there as a cadet, wanted to go to the military because he was a proud young man, wanted to take part in, uh, in a nation that he loved. Uh, and all these cadets, they are the same situation. They didn't know anything, you know. And what can you do as a cadet if, if you get an order, go out to the bridge and defend it? You cannot do anything, you know. 
If not, you're putting... Not, uh, I get there and there's uh, nothing there to defend. No, and there's nothing there to defend, but they said it was a possible terrorist attack. That's why they were there and stopped one side of the bridge, you know? Yeah, yeah. So then suddenly they are in a different situation and that the people are attacking them and they don't know what's happening, you know? And, and you can see on the clips that they are in despair. Mm -hmm. they, they, they're, not, they're not really shooting. Most of the time we can see they're shooting above the head of the people. We are see that they're shooting with rubber bullets. We, we see that they, in the end, uh, 6.30 in the morning, they just lay their weapon down, give themselves to the police, and then the police disappears. Yeah. You know, then the police suddenly leaves the scenario and let these crazy guys, which are prepared to, to attack them, just go there and beat the, the shit out of them. You know, it's, it's, it's awful. How is it possible? There are young kids, innocent kids. One of the most moving moments is there, eight, five minutes into the film, as a father holds up a photograph, a graphic photograph of his son with his face beaten to a pulp. Yeah. And says, my, my son died. Yeah. And on the other side of the photograph is his son in full uniform. Yeah. The tragedy of that family is, is yeah. immense. And he is prepared, to, they are prepared to speak. Yeah. They wanted to speak. They have nothing to lose. They said, we have lost our son. They can do whatever they want with us. They are a very brave family. Uh, they were speaking openly about everything. Uh, and they're speaking also in Turkish, uh, in Turkish news about it. And they want to follow the case because they want to know what really happened with my son. You know, So they want to go to the European Court of Human Rights with the case. And I think we all should support them doing that because it will be also a case that will open up what is happening with all the others. Let me go quickly through the, the other two major events of that night that you focus on. One is the strange actions of, of the Navy, as the Navy are also alerted that there's a potential coup and their ships are ordered out to sea. But when they get out to sea, all they're instructed to do is sail around in circles, while yeah. the Admiral in charge of the Navy all of a sudden becomes... Uh, disappears for four hours he just be, he says he was sitting in his car somewhere yeah yeah yeah he said that in his uh, when he is uh, in a uh, when he's witnessing in in a court case he is telling what he's he was doing so he's telling it himself openly that uh, he was sitting in his car uh, at an uh, parking lot on uh, the european side of istanbul and waiting for uh, and it's quite amazing when all these ships are out sailing and uh, and the, the the captains they don't know what to, to do you know what are we going to do and I've spoken to several of the of the ship commanders and they said that they were basically thinking about their own ship I have you know as a ship commander you have one obligation you have to take care of your ship and your uh, your people on the boat. Mm -hmm. So they were sailing around, and, it, and when I got access, you know, as a journalist, this is really interesting. When I got access to all the all the movements of the of the, the Turkish Navy, and when, when when I saw these movements back and forth and around, you know, I, I didn't know if I should laugh or, or cry. You know, what what's happening here? So those movements, it's make, total chaos. Those movements make no sense to the sailors. The sailors no eventually, the next morning, get back to port. The admiral all of a sudden reappears. And then many of them find themselves arrested. Yeah. And they didn't know. I don't know. They arrested some of them, you know, and they arrested more during the next days to come. But they didn't know why do you arrest him and not me or what, what's going on here? And of course, now we know that uh, these arrests are basically based on different lists, the ready made lists they had for who to arrest and who not to arrest. Which takes me to the next key, key moment there. Uh, you, you actually produce a document that was circulated that evening that outlines events that could not possibly have taken place. That is, it seems to be a pseudo document prepared yes. by someone who knew these events were going to take place. Yeah. But strangely enough, some of the events it records are the events of a coup but a coup that never took place because the events actually never took place. And yet on yeah. this document, which was used in court to arrest many of the yeah. people who were then charged. A remark, how did you get that? Yeah. 
No, I uh, I had I don't have any other answer than that this document by uh, Choshkun must have been ready made, you know, because it was sent out already one o'clock uh, to different areas of the nation of Turkey uh, to tell them you can start arrests, you know. Good so they need they needed a document uh, to base the arrest on yes. uh, and say you are a part of this coup, coup attempt, so we can arrest you. So but I'm uh, uh, actually I don't have any other explanation. But it actually names times and places where events yeah. never took place. Yeah, and this is and this is also the crazy things about the, the timing because it says one o'clock in the in the document from Joshkin, but uh, actually said no, no, that was wrong. It was seven o'clock, but it makes it worse. At seven o'clock, you knew what happened and what didn't happen, and you don't write things that didn't happen uh, seven o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so this is a very strange document, and it should be researched closely, you know. Uh, and I would love to have an interview with Joskin about this. <laughs> uh, we, we probably talked enough about that stunning opening, that first six to seven minutes of the film. Maybe it's time that we gave people a preview and we had a look at the way the film unfolds, the direction of the film, and just a brief preview, and then we come back and talk a little bit more about it and some of the wider elements involved. So let's yeah, throw now a, a little from uh, Jürgen Lawrenson's film, A Gift of God. Adli tıptan bu şekilde linç edilmiş halde adli tıptan aldım. Ben oğlumu bu şekilde teslim etmedim. Dört tanesini öldürdük. Dördünü öldürdük, o beşinciye geldik. The coup attempt gave Erdoğan almost complete power. Türkiye'nin gittiği yön bir diktatörlüktür. Dinci bir diktatörlüktür. İslamik bir diktatörlüktür. Faşizan bir diktatörlüktür. He is the new red line. You cannot say anything against him. I mean, what are you going to do? If they want to arrest you, they'll arrest you, basically. On the very night that the coup attempt unfolded, the mass arrests began. Ama geri dönerken ya yakalanacak mıyım, tutuklanacak mıyım? Çünkü herhangi hatalı bir şey yapmadım. Tamamen bir sivil soykırım nesnesi. How was it possible to begin arresting people so soon? They have a list, a long list, and it's a purge process. This is not the way you do a coup. So we all knew that this was a little bit fishy from the beginning. For three years, we have worked intensively to try to understand what really happened. Dolayısıyla Allah'ın lütfu derken kendisi için tarihsel bir fırsatın ortaya çıktığını gördü ve bunu gerçekleştirdi zaten. Now, I am going to tell a different story. Lawrenson, a gift from God. You can, uh, perhaps it's appropriate to ask you before we actually uh, invite people to uh, to share some questions with us. And if you have questions, um, share them with us uh, via YouTube or uh, from the uh, on the Zoom channel. Uh, you can. What sparked your interest in making this documentary? Because I was there, uh, outside, right outside of Istanbul uh, that night, uh, I was uh, I was there with my family, and um, then we very early got a call from our aunt in Ankara saying flies are flying, uh, jets are flying very low over the city now, so you have to follow television. And then we were sitting together with friends and family, and watching, shifting between the different channels, uh, and seeing what happened minute by minute, and trying to understand. What is really this, you know? Um, and uh, I think it's very clearly that uh, we all felt the same, like uh, uh, Henry Barkey is saying, it, it was a little bit fishy from the beginning. We, because, and then one of the one of the older guys in the in my company said that, no, this is not a coup. I know what a coup is. I've been through two different coups in Turkey, you know. 
So this cannot be a, a coup. And then as a journalist, I said, wow, here is, this is spooky. I hear I have to start working on something and try to find out what happened. And since that, I've been working day and night, trying to follow the different tracks, what happened with the bombing of the parliament, which was absurd, you know, it was no reason for uh, when you're doing a coup attempt to bomb that after the coup is finished. What was the bombing outside of Erdogan Palace? What happened in Marmaris, which is a strange, strange case. Of course, long I did use a long, long time to find out and try to put the pieces together what happened on the bridge. And, you know, all these different things that happened all around. And still there are open spaces here. I, I cannot tell the story fully about uh, the parliament. It's, uh, it's uh, strange. Uh, about Marmaris, we have put together more pieces now, know more about what's happening there, but uh, still uh, things are unclear because we don't find the right people that want to speak about it. And I need people that were there that can open up, you know, the discourse or the dialogue about what really happened at that place that night. One other thing uh, that we should talk about now uh, for just a few moments before we take questions, and if you want to ask questions, please feel free to uh, type them into, uh, into Zoom or into YouTube to the quick Q&A, and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to get to them. Um, it was mentioned by Member Saral in the introduction um, Erdogan has blamed the Hizmet movement and Futula Gulen for the coup. You, you do take us into the background of that in the middle of the program. You say, well, who is this person that uh, Erdogan yeah. is blaming for all his problems? Well, yeah. What's your understanding of the relationship between Erdogan and Futula Gulen, the, the uh the founder of the Hizmet movement, the mentor of the Hizmet movement. What's your understanding of their relationship and why this tension? Yeah, uh, of course, we all know that uh, they worked together for a long time, since uh, 2002. And uh, then it was uh, a shift uh, and uh, a split between them in 2013. And after that, uh, Erdogan has been after the, the Hizmet movement, uh, uh, starting closing uh, newspapers and so on before the coup attempt. And uh, he was very, very quick to state that it was uh, the Hizmet movement that was behind the coup. Already 12, 13 a night, where I think no one really understood what was happening. He knew sort of that is this group is behind it. And then he started arresting people one o'clock from the Hizmet movement. So he, and the thing here is, which is strange, is that, okay, let us think that some officers from related to the Gulen movement, uh, they were behind the coup, if that is this case, you know. Then it's strange to start arresting nurses, teachers, professors, uh, far out in the country that had nothing to do For those with, a, uh, with a coup attempt. They couldn't have anything to do with it. Okay, you're a member of a group. A, a, a network, but I mean, it's a it's a huge perch, and he wanted to get rid of the the Gulen and the Gulenists uh, for many years, and now he got the chance, and then he just cleansed it as he's as he's saying that night. Now we have the chance to cleanse mm. our organization and the military. The Gulen movement has a background in Sufi Islam, which is Turkish in, in its nature and traditions. Um, Erdogan seems to draw his religious ideology, if you like, more from the Sunni, uh, the Muslim Brotherhood and, and that tradition. Do you think yeah. at, at some point uh, a decision is made that one or other of these sides is going to become dominant and yeah. <laughs> it's, it's really first out of the block that's going to, it's going to win this battle? Uh, it, it can perhaps uh, looks like that from a certain point of view, but for if you if you focus on Erdogan in this case, uh, we know from early on that he's a very very smart uh, power politician. He knows how to use power. He knows how to put one group against another group, and then you know use them all in his interests. And uh, he has been surviving so many situations because of this, you know. And huge amount of corruption has going, been going on for years, and people know about it, you know. But he's covering it up with different situations and uh, happenings. And was it perhaps the trigger that when the um, the the, uh, the members of Gulen's movement 
some of them began to say, hang on, there, there are a corrupt, well, couple of corruption issues here that help, help, yeah. have been dealt with, that yeah. at that time, Erdogan decides, okay. Yeah, the so-called 17, 25, uh, December uh, 2030, then we had sort of the, the, the crack was clearly there. It started a little bit earlier than that, but that, then it was very, very clearly that uh, they were going apart. But for me, it was also important that I, I, uh, I started to try to, you know, to get information from security services, from NATO, from Norwegian security, from German security, from American security. And all of them said that we have no, no ideas that uh, we have no, we don't really think that Gulen is behind this, you know. And they stated that very clearly. So when they stated very clearly that they don't think Gulen is behind it, then of course it's opened up a very interesting space for a journalist to find out. So what happened then? You know, and, of and course still, the... and still the uh, international the international intelligence services they don't answer on that question. And of course the differences between these groups is more than uh, religion. It it has to do with orientation. That is the yeah. Sufi tradition. The Gulenists are Western oriented. Um, Erdogan is more towards the old Ottoman caliphate, the, the Sunni uh, yeah. Muslim Brotherhood tradition. Yeah. So you, you yeah. really have a, a deep fissure there that has to do with the fundamental direction of the nation. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, as, a, as a member of the Brotherhood, uh, you know, he looks in a different direction. And we see also what he's doing uh, the last years. He's really trying to go for uh, strategic power in the area to be the Sultan of the whole area. I think it's uh, very. I think that will be very difficult for him because he's not very popular, you know, anymore. He was quite popular ten years ago, but now he's not that popular anymore, you know, mm -hmm. by uh, the Arabs or the Iranians or uh, yeah, Egypt. You know, he has lost power in Egypt also, so he is not very popular anymore. So I think that's a that's a dream he has, and he's acting crazy because of it. But uh, it's uh, yes, and, uh, <laughs> accessible. And his link with the Russians is not going to be helped by the recent Hagia Sophia uh, affair because uh, because uh, uh, <laughs> Russia and Putin are very strong in cultivating the Orthodox Church and uh, the Orthodox Church are outraged. But we have to be clear that whatever Erdogan is doing, and he has been doing that since 2002, is to please his core national audience in Turkey, you know? So he has a good relationship with Putin. He has a good relationship with uh, Trump. He's speaking with both of them back and forth, you know, but everything is to please his audience in uh, his voters, his core voters in, in Turkey. So that's mm -hmm. why he's doing these things because, uh, and then he also keeps the, the focus away from the economical deep crisis Turkey is in. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about some of the characters that you, you met. Um, yeah. One of the indicators of this fundamental east-west fissure is when you meet some NATO officers, some Turkish yeah. NATO officers who are actually in Norway because yeah. they, they have to become refugees themselves. How did they explain the events? You know, it's interesting uh, to see all this because the, the Norwegians are just representatives of all the uh, close to 300 NATO officers that was purged immediately after the coup attempt. They were in Norway when it happened. They have nothing with a, with a coup attempt to do. Uh, they were trained by NATO and has been a part of the NATO system for many, many years. Uh, and, uh, and for them, it's uh, impossible to understand really why they were perched in the beginning. And then, of course, they see that what has happened is that all the uh, Western, Westernized uh, NATO officers, NATO related, NATO trained officers are purged, all of them. And they are replaced by more Eurasian friendly officers in the, in the military. So of course they see this as a shift from West to East and to a closer alliance uh, with, uh, with Russia. And this has also happened, you know, because it was a deep conflict between Russia and Turkey after the shootdown of the jets on the border of, Turkey, of Syria in December 2015. And 
Then right after the coup attempt, Putin and Erdogan became best friends. And we know that also Russians have been in one way or another involved and uh, been there on the, on, on the spot, you know, when, when this happened on the 15th of July. But it's hard. I cannot really tell yet the full story about the Russian involvement here. Mm. But, uh, but for Erdogan, of course, it's good to talk with uh, Putin also. And Putin needs allies. Putin is really in need of good allies. And for him to be an ally with Turkey is, is wonderful. You know, then you have direct access to open sea through Bosporus. Uh, and uh, it's perfect for, uh, for Putin. So I can understand that very well. But it, it was a devastating moment for all these, uh, you know, officers that have been uh, defending uh, and been uh, working for the Turkish nation for their whole life. And suddenly they were just kicked out because of a change of uh, tactics in, in, in Erdogan's head. Mm. Uh, the other person, of course, we should have mentioned that you do take the trouble to speak to is uh, the founder of the Hizmet movement, Fatal Gulen himself. How does yeah. he explain his relationship with Erdogan? Um, I think he, he felt huge despair because of the situation now. And uh, as he says, he's, he feel that he was uh, fooled in a way by the alliance with Erdogan. He's saying that uh, he trusted the guy. Uh, he believed in him. Uh, but he said, uh, but he's saying also that this, this is a huge mistake. You know, to to trust him and believe him and and support him and help him because Erdogan would never ever be in power like he has been since 2002 without the Gulen movement and the, and the support from his net. There were huge helpers for uh, for Erdogan's way to power from 2002 and onward. Because for those so who... I can understand that he he is very very sorry about that now. Yes, for those who don't know. Um... The Gulen movement in Turkey was essentially a civil society movement oriented towards the Western dialogue and so had a huge impact on the society movement. Yeah. Yeah, but uh, I mean, if you go back and start talking about the Ergenegon case and things like that, uh, also members of the Gulen movement were not totally innocent here. They were playing the power game together with Erdogan mm. and uh, arresting top officers, innocent officers. Uh, in the Ar Ar Argenicon case. So, mm -hmm. so they have something to work on too when it comes to their history. <laughs> Let's talk a, a little more. I, I've got some questions that have been sent to us. Um, there's a couple of people very interested in the, this, this document that, that, that lays out there and the person who provided you with the document uh, and who he is and what's, what's his... his What's his game? Which which of the the document of uh, Shoshkin or yeah Shoshkin I think yeah um, this uh, document I got from a journalist uh, that has been uh, fleeing the country and uh, he confirmed the the truthness the truthfulness of the uh, the document by confronting Shoshkin about it and got a reply that. Yes, we can confirm the document, but uh, the, the answer that the, the, the timing was wrong. It was not one o'clock, like it says at night, 1, 1 a.m. in the night, like it says in the document, but it was 7 a.m. in the night. That's uh, their reply to it. And after that, they haven't really replied very much about the document. Mm -hmm. it, it, it sounds from those who are linked to it that yes. this is really... Almost impossible to be can be conceived of as anything other than pre-planned. Uh, I I have to come to that conclusion too. You know, uh, it it uh, absolutely seems like, uh, even though we we haven't confirmed it, mm. uh, everything points to that conclusion. Why then is Gulen the scapegoat? Is a question again from one of our um, our listeners. Um, we've touched on this briefly, but why do you think Gulen is a particular scapegoat? Because uh, people belonging to the Gulen movement, they were very strong in uh, in the judiciary. They had a lot of influence over people's uh, over people in Turkey. They were popular. Uh, they had a huge network, 
uh, and uh, Erdogan, in, when we when we when we come to 2016, he has basically um, control of the military. He uh, had uh, basically control over the, the parliament and uh, most a lot of the different uh, power institutions in Turkey, but he didn't control the the the judi judiciary and uh, and. Uh, he felt also like they they trying to go for him, you know. He was afraid of them also that they would uh, give more documents that perhaps could uh, take him down. So uh, I think it, he felt after 2013 December, he felt it was absolutely necessary to find a way to get rid of the the, uh, the Hisman movement and their influence. Gulen is now in exile, of course, um, and a number of the people you talk to are themselves reluctant exiles. And there's two or three quite moving um, statements from people who are not only reluctant exiles, but actually have the intellectual depth to reflect on the events. What did you gain from them about the, the understanding of not only the, the impact of this Coup, but its significance for Turkey as a country? Of course, when I spoke with the officers, uh, I got a lot of insight into the details of what happened, you know, the movements of that night and the days after. Uh, and when it comes to the family, uh, it's also, you know, how they, how they can uh, follow, arrest, torture, totally innocent people. You know, they had, this family, they had a, uh, there was a sort of linked, you can say linked to the Gulen movement, but not very active at all. Uh, and uh, they were working as civil servant in in uh, in, in Turkish uh, in the Turkish state, and uh, they were imprisoned and, and and very roughly treated, and had to to flee, crossing the marriage, like thousands, tens of thousands of others. Uh, that are feeling that their lives are in threat, uh, and uh, it was it was very uh, it was also a way of getting into the the feelings and emotions of people in that situation. You know, we got very close to the family and understanding their situation very clearly. So it's it was a human. They they are important for the to understand the human parts of this. You know, they're they're single people. They're children that are being perched and treated badly, badly. You so I think it's very important to have that part, you know, the, the, the human part as a, as, a, as a part of the, when we're talking about strategic and politics and everything, there are hundreds of thousands of people here. You talk, to one, two, you talk to one or two academics and intellectuals, but who also have a Turkish background and you can see it's not just a matter of history for them, it is touching them deeply as well. Yeah. Let's uh, yeah, let's reflect. I, I just we've got one or two other questions which take us back a little way, but it's it's probably worth worth asking them. Um, yeah. Do you per, uh, check, um, yeah. that uh, the list of arrests that happened uh, straight after the coup was prepared seven years earlier? Um, and again, it's going to the question of, well, this is more evidence. It seems that things were were, were planned. But but who is Pencek? Explain who he is and his party. It's the Vatan Party, is that it? Vatan, Vatan Party. Party C. Yeah, he's, he's a very interesting guy. Actually, it was really nice meeting him. He was very, very open, very friendly and talkative. You know, he, is, he can say things that others, if they say the same, they will be put in prison immediately. And, and this is, makes him an interesting figure. Of course, I know from studying his history that he has uh, a close relationship with Russia and China. So, and I know also that he was uh, setting up meetings between the leadership of uh, AKP, uh, the, uh, the ruling party, and people from Putin's government during this last six months before the coup attempt. So he was, um, he has a lot of influence. He's, he's um, very, very central for the relationship with Russia, and he is untouchable. Uh, and he is, he can say things about when he when he don't like what Adon is doing. He's saying it, you know, he's saying it clearly, directly out. I think um, 
uh, Penishek because he has influence in uh, in important circles. A lot of the members in his party are are uh, top officers or uh, ex top officers uh, and the top bureaucrats. They are a small party but an influential party. And uh, he's quite open. He thinks that he can control Erdogan. I think, uh, which I, I think is a think little bit of. <laughs> But uh, I, I don't think Adon is very happy for uh, Dovo Perinchek, but I think uh, he needs him. He is important for the link to Russia and to China. Mm. Where does Iran fit in this? Uh, Perinchek is also very, very close to Iran. And we know that there has been uh, in very important trade, uh, gold and oil trade uh, between Iran and Turkey going on for years. Um, and Iran has been important for the Turkish uh, feeding the Turkish economy. Um, so uh, Iran is sort of a strong nation, big neighbor, and uh, I think Erdogan wants him Iran to take part in uh, in uh, in the creation of the huge Islamic uh, Union. So that's why he, he wants to be close to Iran. And, uh, and of course, it has been important for oil and the economy. Let's touch briefly on the wider political implications. You've mentioned the, the relationship with, with Russia, and we've just talked about Iran. But yeah. Western democracies, um, initially, many of us, and you were probably, um, you probably spoke to your Norwegian colleagues in the first few hours after the coup, most people accepted what was being said. And it took um, some journalists around the world some few days to catch up with the events in a way which led to questions. I know from my experience at the yeah. ABC, uh, we called a gathering of, of the news editors about four or five days after uh, the coup and said, look, there are questions that are arising here. And, and the ABC news division took that seriously and began to ask other yeah. questions. But it really did take a little while for other countries to catch on. Initially, yeah. um, uh, the US, do you see that uh, that balance uh, as it unfolded for you? Yeah, uh, I think you know, a lot of the journalists were, they were confused uh, how to interpret what was going on. And then after the coup attempt, uh, Erdogan feeded journalists all over the world, feeded uh, news channels, with material that was telling that it is the Gulen and the Gulen movement that is behind it. And still I can meet journalists that think that Gulen and the Gulen movement is behind the coup attempt. You know, so, so still there are confusion about, uh, about uh, what happened. And uh, to a large degree, Adon has won, I think he has won the, the war with the media that they sort of believe in, you know, or they don't really, care about it very much anymore. And this takes us really to the significance of your document, yeah. because uh, I've got a broad interest in the area, not a, not a terribly specific one. I visited Turkey as a tourist, and you know, I've had associations with people of the Hizmet movement and, uh, and uh, the broader Islamic community in Australia as a, a journalist in religion. But your documentary seems to be one of the first that says, no, we've got to analyze this from the perspective of those of you around the world who may not know about, about these events. Absolutely. Do you see that as, as the key role of this documentary, really, to be one of the first to op open up the issue in a yeah. broader context? You know, it's two things that I think is important. First of all, of course, to tell the story, what really happened. That advanced story is not the truth about what happened that night and the days after. It's a totally different story that uh, we have to tell. Uh, and we have to spread it uh, and we have to inform people that how is it possible that a guy can do or can just blame someone to grab the total power in a NATO allied country? You know, what is this happening in, uh, in Spain, you know, or in, uh, in England or whatever, you know, but it seems like almost the rest of Europe and NATO, they don't care. They, they have given up about talking about it. And this is also because Turkey is so important strategically mm -hmm. and the nato is of course very very afraid of losing turkey mm -hmm. and uh, because he has threatened many times it's saying that i'm leaving nato 
If you keep on going like that, I'm leaving NATO. You know, that's what he's saying. I go to, then he can go to Russia instead. But he doesn't really want to be totally under Putin's control either. You know, so that's why he's sort of going back and forth all the time. Mm -hmm. Second, I would say what is important for me is that I want more people to talk, because I still have open spaces. You know, the puzzle is not finished for me. Still, I don't know what happened here and there, and uh, and we don't have the, um, let us say, the final document if you can call it that, that can say, okay, this is what happened. These are the guys that are behind the coup attempt. Because we have, it's, a, it's still open. It's a, still an open question. I'm quite sure that Gulen was not behind it. Then what happened? Is it a group of Gulenists together with some Kremlins that did a coup attempt in despair of what happened in, in Turkey and the military? Or is it arranged by any other ways? Yes. So I want more people to come out, and we are ready to to continue working, you know, on this uh, on this case. But Western democracies um, are still tolerant of Erdogan, uh, but one has to say that it seems that Erdogan is classified by by some as simply another example of the wave of populist uh, populist leaders that veer to the right politically but we we have to get used to and perhaps manage yeah. over the time what you're suggesting is no Erdogan is something different yes he is that he's taken advantage of the populist wave yeah the conservative wave but he's something else as well he's a strategic thinker in terms of his ambitions for Turkey and this is going it goes back a long way and he's been yeah. able to march his way towards this over a very long time and we underestimate him if we take him as just another another populist right winger. Right. I, I agree with that. And uh, and we have to note a couple of things. Uh, Turkey has the next largest army in NATO after US. Uh, Turkey has uh, stationed nuclear weapons uh, in Turkey. They are uh, American nuclear weapons, but they are they are there, you know. 15 to 20 nuclear warheads there are so it's a it's a it's a dangerous place um, and it's a, it's a huge country and has a huge power and we also have to understand it related to the situation in the middle east because middle east is in, in a huge crisis it's a big chaos there uh, afghanistan is uh, is in war yemen is totally destroyed uh, iraq is in, in war and uh, no, no, no state, Syria, totally destroyed, Libya. So either you have countries which are in, in war and uh, there are no state, uh, effective state, or you have a growing uh, tyrannical or dictatorship, countries like Iran, Turkey, uh, and you see now the movement in, uh, in Lebanon and uh, Egypt. So difficult situation for I think uh, Europe to handle how to handle now, and you see Trump is drawing back. He, de he doesn't really want to have anything to do with uh, with the Middle East anymore. I don't think he understand anything of what's going on there. So, so you see, it's it's a very it's a very difficult uh, area to uh, to work with. It does mean that the American elections actually begin to play some significance in this. Yes. Um, because the Americans can't step away from it ultimately. Uh, no. Something like Biden and the Democrats, if they, if they do come to power, yeah. will have to rethink the whole strategic environment. Yeah, it will be. Uh, but uh, now it perhaps looks like he will not win next time. We'll, we'll see. Cross our fingers. We're drawing to a close. We're going to have to finish up in, in just a few moments' time. But what about yourself in this? You've got family connections, I understand, with Turkey. This has had to be an act of some considered bravery on the part of yourself and your family. How do you feel about your position at the moment? Uh, I can tell you that when we had the premiere of the film here in Norway, uh, the Turkish ambassador in Norway contacted the foreign minister and tried to stop the film. So he had got a message from Ankara that uh, he should try to stop the film from being, being screened. Of course, then the foreign ministry of Norway had to sort of teach him a little bit about uh, how democracy works 
that uh, it was not a film made by the Norwegian state, so uh, we have freedom of speech, so they couldn't do anything uh, about the screening of the film. But it uh, it tells you something about the situation and how they react. And uh, I'm very also sorry that uh, after the screening and after the uh, the launching of the film, the ambassador contacted us and said, from no one, you have to understand that you're an enemy of the state of Turkey. Mm -hmm. uh, and for me, that is also explaining some of the way they are thinking and moving and how, how afraid, afraid they are of the truth. You know, they are very, very afraid that more people will dig into this and start asking difficult questions. And they are very afraid that more people will start speaking because there are people that knows what happened, you know. If you could talk with Hulusi Akkar or uh, Hakan Fidan or any of the other central people in Turkey, it would be wonderful, you know, to get their stories. You have um, friends and acquaintances and family associations with Turkey. Yes. Have there been any repercussions for those who had connections with the film, as we uh, no. understand yet? No, nothing. And I'm very, I'm very happy for that. There have been some threats and, uh, you know, the trolls, I don't trolls are there on the internet. But uh, that was expected. Uh, but uh, nothing more than that. Yeah, Lawrenson, it's a challenging and inspiring film. We um, we do thank you for uh, for your participation tonight, and I'd recommend. Thank you, John. Anybody who's interested in this in the broader context, uh, it's an important film. Jürgen, thanks so much uh, for joining us, and now I'll hand back to uh, Mehmet Saro. Mehmet, thank you, thank you. Well, yeah, thank you very much, uh, John and uh, Jürgen. Um, you, uh, thank you, Jürgen, for the great insight you have given our listeners on the so-called coup attempt uh, um, in Turkey back in 15th of July 2016, now four years ago. I watched your documentary three times now, and I, I have to admit, I find it very informative and very objective. Thank you, you. Have, um, you have viewpoints from um, all circles of, from Turkey, not just the Gulen movement, but from left wing, right wing, from uh, you know uh, many different groups, and that's Objectivity is very important. You even went uh, out of your way to to interview Erdogan, uh, the president of Turkey, who refused to be interviewed. So that shows that you wanted this to be as objective as possible. And, and I have to say, I'm very sorry that he said no. <laughs> I would love to interview him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That would have been a coup. <laughs> it would have been, well, Dor Perinçek, I'm, uh, you know, I'm surprised he took the interview, but he loves being on on, uh, on TV So and, and on any he documentary. Does. Yeah, so he, he would say no to, you say yes to every interview. <laughs> uh, and he's very open. I was very surprised how openly Dor Perinçek spoke uh, in the documentary. Um, the fact that you have, uh, and, and John as well, you know, for the background you have given, uh, on Turkey and the characters involved and the insightful questions you asked uh, Jürgen, I have to uh, admit it, it, it educated our listeners on this topic in a great sense. Thank you for your time, John. It's been great. And uh, as some of you may know, uh, we conducted a gala cinema screening of a documentary film called Erdogan Dictators Republic back in October 2018 in both Sydney and Melbourne. Uh, that film uh, was... Uh, was a film that was uh, produced in America uh, by two uh, producers who happened to be brothers of Armenian background, uh, but American born, who had an interest in Turkey because their parents were born in Turkey. And they also did a very similar screening. And we actually showed that at uh, cinemas outlets in Sydney and Melbourne. In a similar fashion, towards the end of this year, uh, we want to be hosting a gala cinema screening of the documentary, A Gift from God, across all major capital cities in Australia, including Sydney, Melbourne, Canberra, Perth, Adelaide, and Brisbane. And we'll also have, hopefully, Jürgen in person with us. So it will be a huge uh, pleasure. <laughs> please watch your stage. And Jürgen, hopefully, COVID-19 travel restri restrictions will uh, cease by October, November timeframe, which is uh, our sp uh, spring in, in Sydney, uh, in Australia. And uh, we'll uh, would love to host you at that time. And uh, finally, I'd like to thank our listeners for taking time from their busy schedule to watch our inaugural webinar, one of many more to come. And I look forward to, uh, to seeing you at our next event, either virtually or in person. Good night, everyone. Thank you.